we are very lucky to have uh, Shahal of it um, give a talk uh, on uh, active learning and more specifically on the power of asking more informative questions. Um, so Shahar is an associate professor at UCSD in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, he got his PhD in 2010 from the Weizmann Institute uh, and has done a lot of works in a lot of areas uh, ranging from complexity, randomness, uh, optimization, coding theory, and as we will see, uh, machine learning. Uh, uh, he has uh, a Sloan Fellowship, an NSF Career Award, and uh, again, we are very lucky to have him tell us about his recent work uh, on uh, additional uh, queries and questions uh, in active learning. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Shahar. And uh, if you want to start, it's, it's up to you. Thanks. OK, thanks, Clement, for the nice introduction. And thanks, everybody, for being here. So again, let me just repeat what, what I said in the beginning. If you have any sort of clarification question, if anything is not clear, then sort of please stop me and ask. I mean, we'll, let's try to get it to be interactive as we can. Um, and also I wanted everything here is sort of based on joint works with a number of people. And so this, this works actually started maybe three years ago with works with uh, uh, Shai Moan, who was a postdoc then, Daniel Kane and Jia Peng Zhang, who was a PhD student then. And then some of the more recent works I'll talk about are also with Max Hopkins and Gao Mahajan and some of the others. I mean, the several works here that I'll talk about. And all of these works of basically start from the basic question that I'll describe it. What happens if we want to do a learning algorithm and we want to learn something, but we actually allow our learning algorithms to ask more into informative questions about the data. So can we analyze it? Can we define models or frameworks that allow us to study this you know, rigorously? So that's going to be sort of the main drive behind this work. And so again, so the, the starting point, by the way, can everybody see the slides? Yes, no? Yes. Yes, yes, perfect. Because I'm gonna just close a video so I can actually see the slides also. So the starting point in this talk is going to be this area of active learning that I described to you. And then and we'll see that somehow by allowing an active learning algorithm to ask more informative questions in various scenarios can have very significant benefits. So that's gonna be maybe the first half of the talk. And then I'm gonna take a detour and, and sort of show you, oh, there's already a question. Uh, no, no, that was just. Fine, fine. Okay. And then I'm going to take a detour and spend maybe 20 minutes talking about sort of a surprising connection that we discovered a couple of years ago to a question that comes in complexity theory. And then I'll, I'll spend maybe five, 10 minutes toward the end talking about some ongoing research and open problems in, all in the same area. So, again, the starting point is going to be active learning. So, what is active learning? Well, it starts with the following sort of basic observation that, well, if you want to get a big amount of unlabeled data, then it's very easy, right? Like I just Googled for the numbers, or so on Instagram gets almost a hundred images every day, and Twitter gets almost half a billion new tweets every day. So if I just want to get like a huge amount of images to run on my classifier, it's very easy. Of course, the problem is that this is not very useful because most learning algorithms, in particular nowadays deep learning, it's very popular, they want label data, right? They, are, so they, they, they need the data to be labeled in order to learn something from it. And labeling data is expensive because, you know, going over images and telling you, oh, this is an image of a bird, this is an image of a car and so on, takes somebody to do it. I mean, it's a person, some person is a loop. And this, this takes, of course, time, it costs money, so we don't want to do it for all the, you know, 100 million images every day. Well, that's ridiculous, right? So what, what can you do? Well, one approach, that people have been exploring for probably like 30 years now, is called active learning. Like active learning says, well, your learn algorithm gets a lot of unlabeled examples. And it had a query oracle, and it basically imagine the query oracle as you know, sending examples to people. So I mean, basically, to, to make a long story short, I mean, what we want is to ask, to query the labels of a few examples and sort of somehow infer the label of many more, so but for free. And the question is, what can we do it and when can we analyze this? So let me show you one example. It's going to be a very toy example, but it's going to show that at least in some toy examples, this is actually useful to do that. And here's going to be the toy example. 
you'll get an n unlabeled points on the real line in one dimension. It's a one-dimensional problem. And they are labeled plus or minus one as follows. The even secret sort of, you know, target. By the way, can you, can you see the mouse cursor when I move it? Uh, yes. Yes? Yes, okay. So there's a secret target you don't know. The points you know, the, the target you don't know. Everything to the right of the target is going to be a plus one. Everything to the left is going to be a minus one. But you don't know what the target is. So what, what you actually get is you just get these points. And what you want to do is ask the, 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 the labels of few points and, and infer the rest for free. And the question is, can you do it? And of course, the answer in this case is yes, you can do binary search, right? So you start at the middle point, you, you query its label, you can take it a one. Then without making any more queries, you can just for free you know everything to the right it has to be a one because of the way we label the points. And then you go on the middle point that you haven't labeled so far, let's say it's a minus one, you know everything to the left has to be a minus one and so on, right? So with login label, with login queries that we made, we were able to infer the labels of endpoints. So this was very good, right? And the question is, can we extend this like to more interesting settings? And the answer is, well, no. To some extent, the answer is no. Even in two dimensions, you cannot do that. And then we're going to try to think, well, how can we actually make this work? But first, I want to show you why in two dimensions, this is sort of, you know, not feasible. So let me first explain the problem. So what is the problem? It's going to be learning half planes in two dimensions. So here's a problem. Again, it's a very similar problem, but now you get points not in one dimension, but in two dimensions. And again, maybe with the square, it doesn't really matter. So you know the points. What you don't know is a green line. So you know that there is a green line and everything on the top is a minus one, everything on the bottom is a plus one, but you don't know what this green line is, right? So what you really get is just these points. And I'm asking you, well, can you make a few label queries so that you can infer the rest for free. So basically what ideally we would like to do is something like binary search, but now in two dimensions and not in one dimension. And the question is, can we do binary search in two dimensions? So of course, when you see the points looking like that and they look sort of random, it says, well, probably we could do something by first, you know, go over the X axis and then the Y axis and maybe do something clever to combine them. But the answer is, that, at least in the worst case, there is nothing you can do. So let me show you an example why in the worst case, there's nothing you can do, meaning you need a linear number of queries. And this is an example that Sandoz Gupta gave probably close to more than 20 years ago. So here's the example. So imagine you have all your points on a circle, or more generally in convex position, but this is a circle for now. And imagine I even give this extra promise that the secret line that you don't know separates exactly one point from the row. If you maybe the Yes, I mean, the whole point is that somehow, I guess, adding up to what Clement was saying, that if you don't have the label, somehow it's harder to learn, right? You get this uh, unsupervised problem instead of a supervised problem. Um, and again, let me just go back to this example. And this example just shows that sort of, you can build problems in two dimensions where even if they give you the power to choose which points to query, it doesn't really help you because like in this example, you have one point that's going to be queried the plus one. All the rest are going to be labeled minus one. And you need to find the one that's sort of the plus one. And there's nothing much you can do except go and query a bunch of points until you happen to find the right one. And this will take a clean amount of queries. So again, since I don't see people, I don't know if this is clear or not. So any, maybe that's good, are there any questions why this is an example showing you cannot do anything in two dimensions if all you're allowed to do is, is ask the labels of points. Yeah, I just want That's to get some feedback. Right? So I know that people are, I'm still I'm not disconnected. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> you're still on. Still on. Good, 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 good. Okay, perfect. Um, good. So now the question will be: Well, how can we do? I mean, it seems that learning distributions in two dimensions shouldn't be that hard. So how can we rectify this problem? So this sort of like, seems like a pathological you know, configuration. So maybe we could just rule this out. And in fact, there have been tons of research done in the last maybe 30 years, trying to relax the assumption of worst case and saying, well, maybe my data looks nice. It's Gaussian. It has some spreadness. It has this, it has that. Versus assumptions under which people build learning, active learning algorithms. 
but the approach I want to talk about today is a different approach. It says, well, let's still assume the data is worst case in various ways, but maybe we are going to allow the learning algorithm, we're going to give it more power. We're going to allow it to ask more questions about the data. So for example, in this, in this example before here, we're going to allow the learning algorithms to ask the labels of maybe other points, not just the one that's on the circle, but maybe a few other points or something related to that. So I'm going to call this active learnings in reach or informative queries. And so I'm going to define everything formally in, in a few slides, but for now, let's just think about this conceptually. It says, well, what type of additional queries should we let the learning algorithm have the power to do? So, I mean, one thing you could always do, which is of true but useless, is asking arbitrary questions. You could say, well, here are all the possible solutions, maybe all the possible labelings, is the correct labeling in the first half or the second half? Well, if you can ask these questions, and of course you can solve everything that is binary search, but these are sort of very complicated, non unrealistic questions. So I'm gonna think about much more restricted type of question that are closer to what people might be able to solve in practice. And again, there have been tons and tons of work on trying to do very, understand the power of various types of queries, and I'm not gonna be talking about those at all, but I just want to pinpoint that there's a, a big context behind everything here, a lot of context here. Oh, uh, Shahar, yes. uh, sorry, there is a question about the 2D case um, oh, by, uh, yes. by Shushanta Garwal. Uh, what if yes. we consider the pack setup where we need to output the correct line with high probability and not with 100% certainty? Okay, great question. So in general, if you're in the pack setup, then you want to say, well, maybe I have some parameter epsilon, and I just want to give the correct labeling for one minus epsilon of the points with high probability. Well, actually, in, in most cases, you just do some reduction and say, I'm going to sample something like one of the epsilon points, and I want to give the correct answer to all the points out in this sample. And in, I mean, it's necessary, but you can also show it's sufficient in many cases. So you can think about what I want to label is all the points and I have n points, or you can think my error parameter is one over n and I want to be correct probability one minus one, minus one over n. So I want, when I want to only have one over n fraction of errors and I'm already show the sample of n points when we should do it. So, so either way, it's the same. You're reduced to this case where you want to get all the labels correct for a sample of the points. Shushan, did this answer your question? Perfect. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's keep going. So the type of queries that I'm going to be talking about are what we're going to call relative queries, where you can compare maybe two or a few points. So imagine that you're building a, you know, a, a restaurant recommendation app. Maybe you're trying to compete with Yelp. And you're trying to guess if, if I'm going to like or dislike a restaurant, right? So you're going to ask me, well, here's a restaurant. Do you like it or hate it? So I say thumbs up or thumbs down, right? So this would be like the labels you try to infer, whether I'm going to like or dislike a restaurant. Based on that, you're going to recommend this restaurant to me or not. But imagine that your app can also ask relative queries. So, so, I, so I told the app, well, I like McDonald's. I also like Chef Penis. The, then the app could ask me, well, which one did you like more? Right, it'd be a relative query comparing to data points. Or maybe here, like another example, you can do like a three-way comparison. I guess you can see the examples here, right? So we're gonna compare a few points. And in fact, in this talk, I would just be restricting to comparing just two points. That's it, just comparing two points. And we're gonna see what the power of this can give us. So we're gonna have, from this point onwards, we're just gonna have comparison queries. So now let's try to be a bit more formal about it. So just a, a, a quick question about the, the model. So you were saying that arbitrary queries are very powerful, but practically useless because I mean, it's unrealistic. Yes. Uh, here, like, I guess there is a motivation for those comparison queries. Like uh, experts are actually efficient at doing those, right? Yeah, I mean, it seems like a simple thing you might want to do, right? You know, you want to, to label things, but you know, the, the whole point is this labeling doesn't come out of the thin air. There is some underlying data from which these labelings are inferred. And we just try to somehow model the fact that there's this underlying structure and we're gonna ask more questions about this structure. So you can think of it both from like a practical perspective where well, people can compare to things, you know, like maybe you're trying, you're seeing x-rays and you're trying to infer if this x-ray has some specific, you know, 
lung uh, disease or not. So you can ask, you know, doctors, does this x-ray has this lung disease or not? Well, you can also show them two pictures there, which one seems like it does it, has it more, right? So it's, that, that, that's something people can do compare two things. Um, but now let's, let me sort of try to move to a bit more of like a formal um, framework. So we're gonna assume this that underline everything, there's some real valued function. So maybe you know you, you like or dislike restaurants, but for each in your mind, you really have like a score for every restaurant. Like if you like it, maybe it's above zero. If you dislike it, it's below zero, but maybe it's a one or a two or a five or a ten or whatever you want it to be. And you know, so there is this underlying space of functions, all the possible ways people could rate restaurants with numerical numbers. And then the label is just asking, you know, is a sign of the value you give to a specific point positive or negative? And then a comparison would just be take two data points and ask which one of them has like a, bit, a higher value. So that's how we're going to model label queries and comparison queries. We're going to say whether well, this underlying space of functions we get real values, and they could be something simple like half spaces or something complicated like a neural net. It doesn't really matter at this point. And we're going to say, well, what I really want to learn are the labels of all the points, but what I can ask, what I allow my learning algorithm to do is also to compare the value of two points. And what we're going to ask is, well, how is that going to help us? So now let me go back to this example in two dimensions and show you why comparing two data points is actually useful here. So first of all, let me just remind you of the problem. So we're given these sort of points in two dimensions, unlabeled points. There is a way of labeling them, given this green line here that's unknown to you. Everything above it is a minus one, everything below it a plus one. But what you get, to see, sorry, but what you get to see are the points without this green line, right? You get to see just the points, and you try to sort of, you know, learn all the labels as fast as you can, making as few queries as you can. And now you can make both label queries. I mean, asking given a point, is it above or below the line? But also you can ask a comparison query. What is a comparison query here? If I give you two points, you can ask which one is closer to the line. Let's be a way of comparing the distance of two points. And I'm gonna show you why this is useful, why you can recover binary search if I allow you to do comparison queries. So here's gonna be basically binary search in two dimensions, but it's going to look very, very different to how binary search looks in the usual case in one dimension. So I get this uh, n points in two dimensions and I know the points, right? What I don't know is the green line. The green line is here just sort of for illustration, there is this underlying green line, I don't know it. What I am trying to learn is not the green line, because it is the labeling that this green line you know, in, embeds on the point. So we want to learn which points are below or above the green line. So here's the algorithm. First step, you randomly sample 28 points. Why 28? You're going to see later, but 28 is going to work. So I mean, I don't have 28 points here, but imagine I had like 28 points on this slide here. So you sample 28 points, you label them. So now you figure out of these 28 points, which one are below the line, which ones are above the line. And now I want to use comparisons. So I'll tell you how we're going to use them. I'm going to find out of the red points, which point is the closest to the green line among all the red points. And for that, I just need to compare the distances of every pair there. So it's some constant number of comparisons. And similarly for the blue points. And now I'm going to do the following weird thing. I'm going to draw a cone. So I'm going to say, well, take all the red points so here on the right, I have all the red points. Take the convex hull. Take the vertex closest to the green line. It's this one here. And just draw the cone here, right? And this cone is connecting the closest point, the closest red point to the green line with the point, the next point here, and the next point here. Why did they do that? Because here's a, a geometric exercise. Every point in this cone must be a red point, must be a plus. Why? Well, basically, if I give you three points to define a cone, and I tell you this, there is the underlying green line, and this vertex here, this corner of the cone, is closer to the green line compared to this point or this point, then all the points here must be, you know, this entire cone must be disjoint from this green line. So, I mean, if you don't believe me, just think it, about it later. It's, it's a simple exercise. 
And you know, so we just, everything here is a plus, everything here is a minus. We're gonna take all the points that happen to be there. We're gonna label them plus or minus. We're just gonna delete them and repeat. That's the algorithm. So it's simple. Now the question is, why does it work? It could have been the case where, where you look in the red cone or the blue cone, you see very few points, right? That would, that would have been very bad for us. So somehow what we want to argue that in this each cone or maybe in one of the cones, I, I see a large number of points. So that in every iteration, we, we progress a lot. Is there a question in the chat? Yes, there is a question uh, which, uh, to verify are the two closest points to the green light determined by the Oracle? Yes, so the Oracle is, is you can ask the Oracle about two points and it tells you which one is closer. Now remember, at least sample at 28 points. So I can compare every pair and see out of the red points, out of the blue points, and see which ones are the closest to the green line. Okay. And is there a significance to the number 28 here? There is, there is significance and you'll see it in 10 minutes. Okay, thanks. So for now, we just um, you can ask why 28? You, you'll see why in a minute. Um, okay, so why does this work? Why can we hope to argue that this algorithm makes a lot of progress in every iteration? So, so here's gonna be the theorem and the reason should not be clear now, it will become clear later. But the theorem is that in any iteration with some concept probability, we're gonna learn the labels of at least half of the unlabeled points. Okay, so every iteration makes a lot of progress. We're gonna label half of the points we haven't seen, we haven't labeled so far. And of course, each iteration just makes some constant number of queries, right? You know, only sample 28 points. So it's some constant number of labels and comparisons. So overall, you will need something like order log and queries. And the question is, why does this work, right? When you see this picture here, it seems like, oh, we're using geometry. Somehow geometry is underlying what's happening here. But what we're gonna see, this is not really geometry, it's really combinatorics. And because it's combinatorics and not geometry, we can extend it to higher dimensions, we can extend to other settings, and it makes it much, much easier to, to study. But I still think that this two-dimensional example is very illustrative because we see that just asking about labels of points is not useful in this circle example, but doing comparison suddenly become, makes the algorithm run much, much faster. So let's try to understand why. But actually, maybe now is a good point for questions before I start to describe the framework. Like, does anybody have any question about this sort of algorithm that we saw here? And, and what, it, what it does, not why it works, but what, what it does. Any questions on that? So there's a question asking, so it's a constant, but uh, asking, do we need 28 choose two comparisons to find the closest pair? So the answer is gonna be no, because you can do a sort of sorting. So you can do 28 log 28. And that's actually gonna be important later on when we're gonna to move to higher dimensions and 28 will be sort of something larger. But yeah, you can do it. If you want to find basically, the, even this, if, let's say, let's say the closest point out of some number of k points, you just do it with order k. So actually, even here, you can just do it with order of 28, or in fact, 28. So you just, just 28 comparisons for the red points and for the blue points. So you don't need 28 squared. So we just want to find the closest ones, the minimum out of a number of things. And uh, thank you. And there is an, there are two other questions. Uh, so one of them is uh, by Stratis Ioannidis uh, asking, it sounds like the algorithm could be run with cl classic labels too, rather than comparisons. No, if not, why does it fail? Okay, good. So what happened? Why do we need the comparisons? So let, let, let me just go back a bit. There is something from Wikipedia. Let's go here, right? And I have this green, I have this red cone. And let's say I knew that these three points are on the bottom of the green line, but I didn't know that this one is closest. Well, in such a case, you could, there are other green lines where I know the three points are on the right side, but this green line intersects the cone. So if I want to guarantee that the green line doesn't intersect the cone, I need to also know that this point is closer to the green line compared to this point and to this point. I mean, think for example, if you want to see an example, think about these three points here and take the cone starting from here, going here and here. So I know that these three points are on the right, but this one happens to be closer than this one. So this cone here would intersect the green cone. 
So I need this extra information that I don't get just from the labels. I need this extra information. And then I see Rupe is asking, do we know the total number of labels in advance? Well, in this case, are just two labels, plus and minus, right? So, so it's two. So I don't know if this is what you meant. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay, good. So yeah, in this case, I just, and you can try to extend to more than two labels, but just to keep things simple, let me just keep it with binary labels in this talk. Okay, any more questions? Okay, if not, then let's continue. So, oh, there was one more question. Is it essential that the Oracle can answer both label queries and comparison queries? Yes, it is essential. Because if you can just do comparison, somehow you can't even tell if a point is on the right, left or the right. And if you can just do labels, we've seen an example where you need the linear number of queries. So it is essential that you can do both. And uh, so I, I have a, another question in the, in the model. Uh, so here the costs, I guess, is just unlabeled points are kind of free. Uh, Label queries are expensive and comparison queries are expensive. Uh, is there like, does that generalize somehow to, if I weight them, is there a trade-off between those, that, that, that kind of question? I mean, you could probably do that. And we will see that in the algorithms, I will show you the number of label queries and comparison queries is gonna be more or less the same. I'm sure some, only roughly the same number. So you don't get okay. any significant benefit to making one of them much more expensive than the other one or much cheaper. But it, okay. there definitely could be settings like that, but not, not here, not in this talk. Okay, because for example, to, to, rebound, uh, to, to bounce off uh, Arya's question here, mm -hmm. if, is it possible to have fewer label queries by first asking which one is the closest and then just at some point asking what the label are just to figure it out, like uh, to figure out as little information as possible uh, in that sense? Maybe, yes, but um, possibly, I don't know. Possibly. I, I don't think this will improve more than constants, but it is possible. Okay, thanks. Oh, and sorry, one more question by uh, Cheng Yang, asking if it's essential that there is actually a green, uh, that it's realizable. Is there, uh, is it essential that there exists a green hyperplane that is perfectly correct? I mean, uh, no point is on the wrong side. And what, what happens if it's not the case? Oh, okay, that's, that's an excellent question. So everything I'm going to describe today in the realizable case, and you can ask what happens if you're not in the realizable case. Well, there are a few things you can go between that are not realizable. One case is that, well, what if you can ask the labels or comparison there's some chance of an error? I mean, there is a realizable green line, but no, your Oracle can make mistakes. That's one option. The other option is that there is no underlying green line. Really, it's like maybe 1% of the points are on the wrong side and there is no way to do it. And let's look at the chat here. And, the answer is that in the agnostic case, when there is no, no green line, we have no clue what to do. And that's like a very interesting open question, not just for what we do, but in general in open, in, in active learning. It seems that many approaches sort of fail when we don't have an underlying realizable truth. When you have errors in the, in the, in the, in the Oracle can make uh, mistakes and sort of, we have some follow-up works where we can handle some types of errors but not all of them. And again, that's just, I think it's very open-ended at this point, but we can handle some things. So, but yeah, but definitely in the agnostic case, we have no clue what to do. So everything is wide open. I think even in two dimensions, it's not clear what to do. Okay, more questions? Yes, again, so in this talk, everything is going to be realizable. And maybe when we get to the end, I'll tell you what, how things change when we move to the non-realizable case. Because okay. even, even in the realizable case, things are, are not that easy. So now let me sort of try to, okay, what, oh, one more question, perfect. Uh, so Arya is asking- Noisy Oracle and imperfect lines equivalent. No, they're not equivalent because Noisy Oracle should be easier because they say there is this underlying truth, but maybe every question asks the Oracle independently can be, I can get the wrong answer. And of course, if I ask the same question twice, I'm gonna get the same answer. So I cannot just 
remove errors by asking the same question a few times. But you know, we know that every answer is independently um, could have an error. Of course, if you think about an adversarial oracle, then it's the same as an imperfect green line. So you don't want to think about an adversarial oracle, you want to think about an oracle that makes mistakes with some probability. But there is some underlying truth. Yeah, but again, the Halberg case is an adversarial oracle, which is equivalent to an imperfect green line. In this case, we have no clue what to do. Okay, so now that is good. Perfect, I'm happy that this is interactive. Okay, so now let me tell you this, this, this um, machinery that we developed to try and study this problem in, in more generality. And the, the, the planar case is gonna be a special, a special case of that. And we call it inference dimension. And the whole philosophy behind it is the following. What we were trying to find is some combinatorial dimension. Think about VC dimension as an example. So some combinatorial dimension of a problem but one that allows for some asymmetry. So asymmetry between what? Between what we wanna learn, like in this example, labels of points, and what the learning algorithm is allowed to ask. Like in our case, both labels and comparisons. So we want some notion of the combinatorial dimension that allows us to capture that. But the hope is that if you can find a good definition here, that may be very similar to puck learning, you can basically reduce learning to understanding this dimension. Now in, in puck learning, we know that the VC dimension of a problem basically controls the ability to do a passive learning for it, uh, both in the diagnostic and the realizable case. Again, here we're just in the realizable case, but now we want to allow this asymmetry. We're trying to understand is there such a combinatorial dimension. And again, in our example, what we want to do is we want to learn labels but we allow the learning algorithm to ask either label queries or comparison queries. And we call this parameter inference dimension. So now let's try to define this more formally. So here's a bit more formally. So we have some domain X of points and we have concepts H. And now we are saying a, con a concept H can answer two types of questions. I can give it a point X and it's gonna return the label of the point, plus or minus. I can also give it a pair of points, x1, x2, and I want it to give me some answer, plus or minus. And again, I want some sort of consistency between these answers. I, I want somehow some restriction that says, not all possible combinations of answers are possible. So hopefully if I ask the labels and comparisons of a few points, I can learn the labels of more points. So how can we define this consistency? So here's the way we did it. So we first need to define this notion that we call inference. So what is inference? So it's the following thing. So let's pick some set of points. Maybe this is, these are these 28 points that we sampled. And there's this underlying hypothesis, maybe it's a green line. What is H of S? H of S means all the answers to all the questions you could possibly ask about points in S. So all the labels of points in S and all the comparisons of every pair of points in S. So in this example in the plane, this would be for every point in the sample S of these 28 points, what is a label? Is it above or below the line? And for every pair of points, which one is closer to the green line? So basically I want to sort them based on the distance from the green line. But, but again, I want to think about this more combinatorially and say, well, every hypothesis gives me some labeling of points and some labeling for pairs of points. And H of S is all these answers. And then we say, given some point X in the universe outside S, we're gonna say the following thing. S infers X under H if the following thing is true. If I give you all the answers to all the questions on S, you can uniquely determine the label of X, okay? So if you ask all the possible questions you could possibly ask about points in S, labels and comparisons, you can learn the label for free of some point X outside this. So this is what we call inference. And now this sounds abstract. I'm gonna give you an exam, two examples showing that in, in a couple of slides, but let me give one more abstract slide before I give you this, 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 these examples, which is what we call this inference dimension. So, so I have two equivalent ways of thinking about it. 
So what is the inference dimension? It's a minimal number K with the following property. Take any set of K points, any hypothesis. There's always a way after you've seen everything to choose one of these points in the set S such that the following thing is true. If I give you all the answers to all the questions about points outside in, in S, but not in X, or the other points in S, you can for free infer the label of X under H. So I know this sounds very abstract, so let me give you a couple of examples illustrating that. So the first one is going to be this first example we've seen of thresholds on the real line. So here actually we just need labels, we don't even need comparisons. And here I'm claiming that the inference dimension is three. Why three? Well, take any three points on the line and take any way of labeling it that, that are consistent with no threshold. So there could be two cases, either all the labels are the same or they're not. So in the first case, let's assume they're all the same, that is all plus. Well, if, that, if you know that they are all plus, after seeing all of that, I can just delete this middle plus. You don't see it, but you don't need to see it, right? Because for free, you can tell well, if there is a point on the left, it's a plus, there's a point on the right, it's a plus, this has to be a plus as well. There's no other way. So if I give you the labels of these two points, you can learn the label of this middle point for free. The other case, if the three points have different labels, let's say they are plus, plus, minus, well, in this case, I claim there's always some end point that can be inferred for free, right? So if you see plus, plus, minus, then you can just erase the label here on the left and say, well, I don't need to see it because I can infer it for free, just knowing that these two points are plus and a minus. So this shows that in one dimension, for any three points in any way of labeling them, there's always one label you can erase and then reconstruct it for free based on the other two labels. So the inference dimension of one dimension is three. Is this clear? Before I move to the two dimensional case, I want to make sure that this, this, this example of one dimension is clear. Notice here, we don't need comparison, we're just using labels. And this is consistent with the fact that our binary search in one dimension just uses labels, not comparisons. So now let's just, move to to, just to make sure, yes, yeah, so it's free if I use only labels and it's also free even if I allow comparisons. Yeah, but allowing comparisons make your life easier, not harder, right? You get more yeah, information that you can then choose. Get, but it won't go down to two. No, it will not go down. Cannot go but for example, if my set of queries on the line were uh, labels plus, is it the minimum or the maximum that like the, a weird comparison, which is like, is it an extremal point? Like, is it the maximum point? Uh, then that would. It might, again, it yeah, might like, happen in some settings. And you could try and invent some, some more complicated query that would be, but okay, but somehow, so here's something crucial. So we need our comparisons to actually act on two points. And more generally, we need our queries to act on a constant number of points. Otherwise, what I'll, I'll be telling you later is not true. So it is actually important that comparison just operate on two points. Okay. Or, or maybe three or four, doesn't matter, but some constant number. Okay, what happens in the plane? Now let's understand the plane example from this more combinatorial perspective. So I claim that if I give you seven points in the plane, and, you, and there's the, then there's always a way of deleting the labels of one of them, so you can learn it for free. So you can imagine having seven points, when on one side of the green line, there must be at least four points. So let's say it's here. So if I, if I see these four points, and I tell you here, this point is red, this is red, this is red, so the right side, and this one is closer than this one to the green line, and this one is closer than this one to the green line, and I tell you nothing about this last point, you don't need to ask any questions about it, because for free, you can infer that it has to be a plus. I mean, you don't know the distance of it to the green line, but you don't care. You're just trying to infer the label of it based on the comparison of these three points. So again, for any seven points in the plane, after you see all the data on them, there's always one point that you can just hide the label of it, and you can learn its label by doing labels and comparisons on all the other six points. And in fact, you don't even need all this information, you need some subset of it, but it doesn't matter. All the data on the other six points for free gives you this last point. So this is why in two dimensions, this number is seven or at most seven. 
So actually here you can show this number is actually five, but let's, 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 let's not go there, it doesn't really matter. It's at most seven. Um, notice by the way that knowing which of the seven points is the one you can hide the label of, you don't know a priori. So it's a non-deterministic measure, right? After seeing the labels and comparison for all the seven points, then you choose which point you wanna hide the label for. So it makes your life easier, right? You just want to show that after seeing all the information, there's one label I can erase. So it's a non-deterministic measure. Any questions? I mean, I, hopefully these two slides clarify this definition. I think that's the most abstract definition in this talk. Yeah, there was a question in the chat, following up. Yes, sir. And it was there, the complexity that I know of, of closest pair algorithm. So yeah, the question is following up an earlier question for finding the closest pair, the complexity uh, that I yeah, know of just, so closest so pair. We're, we're, we're not solving closest pair. We are, okay, that's the question. We are not solving the closest pair. So imagine that for every two points, I can tell you which one is closer to the green line, right? So every point has a distance to the green line, but you don't know, but you can compare the distances of two points and see which one is bigger. So really you just want to compare some number of points and, and find the minimum of these distances. So just linearly the number of points. Like in this case, it's gonna be three queries, right? The and there's another question by uh, Rupe. Yeah, Rupe. No, we, we don't need any sort of fancy theorem to guarantee us existence of happen. We assume this happen exists. So remember this hyperplane is, is what we are, is, is giving us this realizable labeling. And this is just a tiny sample. I mean, we have n points and could be a billion. We just sample like, you know, 28 points. So the, the fact that you can separate them doesn't mean anything. You really are trying to learn something about the global separator for this very local sample. So we don't need any ham sandwich theorem here or anything like that. Look, we're assuming there's this green separator, this green line. Any more questions? Okay, so let me continue. So here's gonna be the general algorithm. And the general algorithm you'll see has nothing to do with geometry. It says, take any, and this will be like the, the learning in the plane is gonna be a special case of that. So the general algorithm said, take any concept class for which you can prove that the inference dimension is bounded, it is at most K. Like you know, in the plane it was most seven. And here's the algorithm. You sample four K points whose labels are still unknown. And remember, four times seven is 28. This is how we got to 28. We compute all the possible queries of this sample. So all the labels, all the comparisons. So basically we're doing sorting. And, and then I'm gonna ask, well, given this information, which other labels can you infer? Now, in general, that's sort of a combinatorial question, but when we have linear separators, this is really a linear program you want to solve. But the analysis doesn't depend on that. Just ask information theoretically. Given this information, what other labels do you know for sure have to be a plus or a minus? Infer them for free, delete these points, and continue. That's the algorithm, very simple. And the theorem says that if you can bound the inference dimension, this is going to work. In every iteration with some constant probability, I think it's a half here, you're going to label half of the unlabeled points that you haven't learned the label of so, so far. So the number of iterations you need is just order log n if you have n points. And again, learning half planes into dimension is a special case where we sort of use geometry to bound the inference dimension to be seven, and then we use this generic algorithm to do the active learning. So we're not using the geometry directly to analyze the algorithm. Any questions on this general algorithm? Okay. So uh, here the factor k, the factor four, like so we sample four k points, not four. The factor four is to make sure that we get half the unlabeled points, right? It's so really to, this to get four is just the four is because this constant we want it to be a half, and this is a half. Mm -hmm. But this four could be like 1.1 1 .1 if you wanted it, just to be some constant more than one. 
Okay, and if we were just to take one, we would only infer one of a k fraction. Uh, in just at one point? No. No, if you one point, you one times k. No, oh, no, one times k. No, we, we, you make. Yeah. No, we can't make any guarantees on that. If you get k plus one points, then you yeah. can guarantee like a one over k fraction. Yeah. But once okay. you're going to take yeah, a constant times k, where the constant is more than one, you can guarantee they're going to infer a constant fraction of the points. So you, okay. you get the, so there is a really a non greedy thing happening here. There's a threshold. Up to k points, you learn nothing. More than like one point one k, you learn a lot. So there is a, a really a really threshold behavior here happening. Thank you. Okay. More questions? Okay. So I'll continue. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. So now, I mean, I, I will not talk much about how we prove this algorithm, how we analyze it, but I, I do want to talk a bit about, well, how, how far does it extend? So what happens if you move from two dimensions to D dimensions? And first of all, I want to say that in general, we have bad news that you can even build examples with three dimensions that sort of looked our example in two dimensions, but somehow blown up in some way, where the inference dimension is infinite even if you assume something about margin. So, so somehow, go over 0.3 of the algorithm again. Sure, 0 0.3. 0 0.3 is the following thing. It says, you ask some queries about the sample, labels and comparisons. And now you're gonna say, let's go through all the possible points that haven't labeled so far and ask, can I, find, can I infer the label of this point for free? Meaning, when can't I? I cannot infer it if there are two hypotheses that agree on all the information I know, but disagree on the label of this point. In this case, I just don't try to label it. But if all the hypotheses that are consistent with the data I got, with the queries I made, all of them labeled my point plus, then I know my point must be a plus. I, mean, I don't know which hypothesis it is, but I know this point has to be a plus. So this is what we do. We go through all the points and just try to infer them without making any more queries on the data. This is what step three does. Does this clarify the question? Will this generalize for more than two labels? Yes, there's nothing special about two labels. It's just easier to present. So we know the set of all unlabeled points. Yes, so we are assuming that you get all this unlabeled data a priori, yes. Like imagine you download like, you know, a gazillion pictures from uh, I don't know, Instagram, and now I'm trying to label them. But you know the data that you download it, right? Okay. okay, so first of all, if you're in a completely adversarial case, you can, you can build examples where this doesn't work in three dimensions, but they are very pathological examples. So the interesting thing that you could prove is that if you sort of remove these pathological examples, then you can actually get very effective bounds on the, in I just want to mention here two regimes of parameters where we can do that. So one regime that's gonna be actually, the first one is bound with complexity, is actually more interesting for the application that I'll tell you about coming up in complexity. And it says, well, if, what if all my points are not, have a arbitrary precision, but they're actually sit in some grid. This grid has some size B in dimension D. So to describe even a single point, I need D log B bits. In this case, we can prove that the inference dimension is, is this order the number of bits you need to represent a single point. So for example, if you know that all your points have some, if B is a constant, all your points are let's say binary in zero, one to the D, then the inference dimension will be auto B, which is the best you can hope for. The other case, which is more relevant for machine learning applications, if, if you assume that all the points have some minimal margin, and again, in which case we can be get of what's this with off, the optimal depends on the margin, so it's logarithmic in the margin. So I will not tell you about how we, we prove the things. I mean, basically what we did is, because the algorithm is very simple and, and in the proof that I'm not gonna describe it the generic, we basically pushed all of the heavy lifting into how do we bound this inference dimension? So under which conditions on the data can we bound the inference dimension? And, and improving in both of those are like more technical, proving these two bounds, this is where all of the technical stuff is happening. But again, I will not be describing this here. Because now, now 
if there are no more questions, I want to switch gears to a very surprising application in complexity theory that we discovered of following this work. So maybe that now is a good point to see if people have questions. And also I see the time is already 12, but sort of we started late and we had connectivity issues. So I mean, I'm hoping people can stay, but if you cannot, then that's, that's life, I guess. But I will probably need another 20, 25 minutes to finish, assuming that's okay. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's okay as far uh, as we're concerned. So again, yeah, if you, if you have time constraints, uh, feel free to leave. The talk will be posted on uh, YouTube uh, uh, either today or tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Yes. And also, I'm very happy that people are asking questions. Uh, this makes it much more interactive and much, much nicer for me. Okay. So now I want to move to this application. So now it's for something completely different. And again, hopefully everybody recognizes this is going like a multi Python. So here's going to be the, the connection. So first, I want to describe something that's completely different. So we're going to switch gears for the next maybe five, 10 minutes. And then we're going to see how things connect together. So I want to think about this problem that probably many of you have heard about called threesome, where it's a following of cute problem. You're given n numbers, and you know you want to see if three of them sum to zero. And you want to ask, well, how fast can you solve this problem? So I mean, of course, the naive thing is just try all possible triplets and see if they sum to zero. This is n cube time, but you know, of course, if you think about this for like you know five minutes, you see that you can do this in a n square time. Are you, any, you see I'm talking? No. Yeah. My son came to say hi. Yeah. So um, there's, a, there's actually a quadratic time algorithm. To do that, basically, what you do it once I. Go over here. Okay. So um, quadratically, what you do when you go over all <laughs> pairs, you sum them, you put it in a big hash table, and you check if every number that's negation is this hash table. So you do it in quadratic time. And the question is, well, can, can you do better? I mean, it seems like a nice you know, interview type question, but now, I mean, can we do better? And, and why should we care? And why should we spend so much time on this specific sort of you know, innocent looking problem? So the reason this question came into prominence is actually from this work by Gajentan and Overmars from like 25 years ago. So they are researchers in computational geometry. And what they observe is the following remarkable fact. There are many, many problems in computational geometry for which the best algorithms we know are quadratic. And people have tried very hard to improve them and fail. And they try to understand why. And what they observe is that, well, you can actually embed threesome as a special instance into many or all of them. So in particular, for any of these algorithms, you can find a faster than quadratic time running algorithm along the way we will have to find a faster than quadratic time algorithm for threesome. So somehow threesome captures, to some extent, the, the core of the complexity of these problems. And they made the following conjecture. Well, that quadratic is the best you can do. I mean, maybe you can improve some log factors or something like that. But any algorithm for threesome requires essentially quadratic time, n to the 2 minus theta log 1. And, and so you know, more recently, this is part of this, you know, body of work on fine grain complexity. It's, it's emerged in the last maybe 10 or 15 years. People have find more connections to areas outside computational geometry. So for example, to graph algorithms, dynamic data structures, and a bunch of other areas. So this is show that why we should we care about this threesome question? Because it really underlies the complexity of many problems we care about. So what can we say about it? Well, actually, instead of looking at threesome, let's try to generalize it a bit. So I claim that threesome is actually a special case of a problem called the point location problem, which is probably one of the best studied problem or family problems, both in computational geometry, also in discrete geometry. So what is this point location problem? So it's the product defined by hyperplanes that partition space into cells, polytopes or polyhedras. And there is an unknown point in space and you're trying to figure out in which cell it belongs. Like here's an example in two dimensions. So I have these four lines that partition the plane into half planes and then recursively into sort of polytopes. And I have and I know these lines, I know these blue lines, 
What I don't know is this, this is my input, X is my input. And I'm trying to figure out that X belongs to this triangle here. What does it mean to belong to this triangle here? It means I need to know it's on the left of H2, it's below H1, it's above H4 and so on. So this is a point location problem. So again, let me, let me just try to reformulate it. You know, to simplify the notation from now, I'm gonna assume everything, all the hyperplanes are homogeneous, meaning they're going through zero, which you can always get by embedding in dimension one more. So let me just assume that for now. So you have homogeneous hyperplanes. What does it mean to know the cell of a point? It means to know for every hyperplane in my collection, what is a sign of the inner product of X and H. This inner product is gonna be positive if it's above H, negative if it's below H or zero, if it happens to lie exactly on the hyperplane. So what we're trying to figure out is some efficient way of computing this vector of signs, or maybe some implicit information about it. For every hyperplane, is it below it, above it, or on top of it? And why is three sum a special case of that? Because of the following. So three sum corresponds to the following very special collection of hyperplanes. So the hyperplanes are all the, well, again, H is just a normal here, the hyperplane. It's just zero, one to the n, and they have three ones and the rest zeros. And if I think of my input of three sum, not of n numbers, but instead of a vector in Rn, then having a three sum means exactly that it has inner product zero with one of these vectors, right? Three of these points sum to zero, let's say xi plus xj plus xk sums to zero, if and only if the inner product of this vector x with the ei plus xj plus ek is zero. Well, this is the unit vectors. This is just one of these vectors in this collection H. So three sum is really a special case of point location problem where these hyperplanes have this nice, but you know, zero one structure. So is this clear? Is, is, is it clear? What is the definition of point location problems and why three sum is a special case of that? So now is maybe a good time to ask questions. So, the model that we're going to be studying is this model called linear decision trees, which seems to be a natural computational model when we try to solve these point location problems. And there are just going to be adaptive algorithms. We're going to, and there's this point X that you don't know, which is the input. And this could have like maybe arbitrary precision. So you can't quite ask what is this input. But what you can ask, well, here's the hyperplane. Is it below it, above it, or on top of it? And that's going to be, you know, me. Uh, I'll talk about this later, but this is really a non-uniform model. All that we really care about is how many queries you're gonna make to this data. That's gonna be so, so similar to what we see in this active learning perspective. So we don't care about computation you do offline, but we really try to minimize the number of queries you make to the data. So maybe here's an example. I want to solve the region where X belongs to. So maybe the first question is I'm asking about H2. So I learn where it has to be on the left. So I know now that my data is somewhere on the left. And then now I'm gonna ask about maybe H3, and now I know it's below, so now it has to be this sort of green triangle here. In particular, I know I don't have to ask about H1 anymore, but now I know it has to be below H1. So again, something here. And now I'm asking about H4, I know it's on top of it, and now I know it has to be this green triangle here. So with that, we know, even though we asked three que questions, we know how to compare X to all the four hyperplanes, in this case, the four lines. Okay, so now you're asking, well, let's go back to this threesome problem and ask, we had this quadratic algorithm for threesome, turns out you can translate it into a linear decision tree of quadratic depths. And moreover, every question you're asking about your data is a very natural query, it's gonna be a label query. It's gonna ask, here are three points, is there some positive, negative, or zero? And by asking a quadratic number of these queries, you can basically learn everything. That's very natural. So you can ask, well, if you're only allowed to ask these questions, can you at least prove that you need quadratic number of queries? That again, our goal would be to show that we need something more than linear, right? So we're trying to show why quadratic is, is necessary. So this in fact was proved by Erickson in a very sort of fundamental work in the late 90s, where he showed that, well, any linear decision tree that you construct that can only ask these types of questions about the data must ask a quadratic number of queries. So if we think of these as the natural queries and quadratic is, the, is you know, a limitation of the running time, 
And in fact, what he proved is even stronger. He proved that, well, not just these queries, but any three sparse queries, any query that said, here are three points and I can scale them, like maybe not 2x1 plus 5x7 minus 100x10. Is this positive or negative? Even with these queries, you still need the quadratic number of queries. So maybe the three some conjectures holding this linear decision tree model in general. If this is true, it will at least rule out many natural algorithms because as it turns out, many algorithms people come up with in, in, in geometry, in computational geometry, actually underlying them are linear decision trees. So either way, this is the way you access the data. And then you need also to do the offline computation in a, in a fast way, right? You also care about the offline computation. If you can prove low bounds for linear decision trees, they will also prove low bounds for many, many natural algorithms. So this all was sort of shattered in this breakthrough work of Gronlund and Petty from about six years ago. Well, they showed that for three sum, you can actually do better. They gave a linear decision tree of depths, something like n to the three halves, so better than quadratic. And now this linear decision tree could ask four sparse queries, not three sparse. So it shows that somehow by allowing our linear decision tree to ask somewhat more complicated questions, you can get it to sort of ask less questions. And what I want to show you is just using our inference and dimension framework, you can for free improve this to near linear by asking six sparse queries. And in fact, very simple six sparse queries, you're just going to take a three, three points and other three points and ask which ones have like the larger sum. And in fact, the same technique as is would work for many problems studied in the literature and K-sum, all Perseus path and more. And all of them, you can get basically the best bound. You could get up to some log factors. And the main, and in particular, it showed that the threesome conjecture is false in this LDT model. So if you're allowing LDTs, even slightly going beyond three sparse, you can solve this problem in nearly in our time. And then you can ask, well, how can I interpret that? Well, there are two ways to interpret that. If you're doing complexity, you're saying, well, this linear decision tree is powerful enough to basically solve the problem in nearly linear time. You can basically read enough information about the input to determine the answer. So maybe it's not very relevant to analyzing algorithms. If you're an algorithm person, you would say, well, maybe this shows us a lot, of, a lot of information you can learn from these queries. Maybe you can use this as a way to design faster algorithms. So the way you want to interpret that sort of depends on your viewpoint, but either way it says that by these queries, you can actually learn this in, in nearly now time. And the main insight here is gonna be duality. So remember this linear decision tree for point location problems is, is in general the following family of problems. You have a known hyperplanes that define your problem. What you don't know is this point. What you're trying to decide is whether this point is below or above these hyperplanes for all of them which is just a sign of XH for all H in this collection. And the way you can do it is by asking adaptive linear queries on this X with any H that you want. And now let me just sort of go back and talk about this active learning question where we say, well, it's exactly the same problem, but just a dual version of it. Now we get a set of known points. What I don't know is the hyperplane. I want to learn all these labels, again, the same inner products, and I can do this. It's basically the same mathematical problem, but we just dualize points versus hyperplanes. So because it's the same problem, we can apply the same solution. So what is a dual problem for threesome? Well, it's the following active learning problem. You get points, the points are zero, one to the n. The three ones rest zero. There's an unknown hyperplane. And what you're trying to decide if this hyperplane 